The G-forces the drivers experienced last week at the Texas Motor Speedway forced the postponement of the race. Here in Nazareth, the drivers have something to prove as they prepare for the 15th running of the Nazareth 225. Hi and welcome, I'm Paul Page. A week ago at Texas Motor Speedway, these were the cars too fast to race. Now they're at Nazareth and ready to try it again. They call this track a one-mile oval. Well, if it is, maybe somebody dropped the oval because depending on who you ask, it has from between three to five turns. Fast speeds, but substantially lower G-forces. And if you want to know about G's, ride a roller coaster. You'll sustain two to three G's, but only for a few seconds at a time. Last week in Texas, the drivers experienced the highest recorded G loading in race car history. Today at Nazareth, the G loads are less, but still it's a very busy environment. For the drivers, they'll have their hands full. The G loading, well over three and a half, even four G's. It's a bone crushing environment, but if you like high speed rides, you've come to the right place. is fresh off his pole position run in Texas, and now he returns to the track where he scored his first career podium finish. And he, again, is continuing his dominant performance in qualifying. Out of four tries this year, Kenny Breck has qualified no lower than second, which is where he starts the race today. Now, he's been fast in qualifying, he's been fast in practice, every place he's gone, but he has yet to score that first career victory. As much as he's been dominating practice and qualifying, we think that win should be any time now. Paul? Bruno Zapira is on the pole. No rookie has ever won his first oval race. Here's the Kawasaki starting grid with Junkera and Kenny Breck on the front row. The second row, Michelle Jordan Jr. and Oriol Servia. Michelle Jordan starts third. His team has one podium finish at Nazareth. Row three, Elio Castroneves and Adrian Fernandez. In the fourth row, it's Brian Herta and Paul Tracy. Back in row five, Cristiano D'Amata and Tony Kanaan. Cristiano is the current points leader. He won last year for the one-mile oval in Chicago. In row six, it's Jimmy Vassar and Dario Franchitti. Back in the seventh row, Michael Andretti and Max Pappas. Michael is a 14-time career oval winner and led 431 oval laps last season. In the eighth row, the defending champion, Jill DeFerrin, and Roberto Moreno. Row nine, Christian Fittipaldi and Tora Takagi. The tenth row, Sinji Nakano and Alex Tagliani. Alex Zanardi and Patrick Carpentier make up row 11. From now on, it's all rookies. Scott Dixon and Max Wilson in row 12, and Nicholas Manassian in the 13th row. Just under a mile, the lap distance here. They'll race 225 laps for 212 miles. We're expecting two pit stops. They could be in as early as lap 30 if a yellow comes out that soon in the race. Well, the word has just gone out to the pace car that they want to go green next time by the field already formed on the back stretch. The front row, Junkera and Kenny Breck. Kenny Breck has started the front row in every race this year. They close in tightly. They all understand how critical the start is and how difficult it is to pass. Green flag flies. Junkera and Breck go side by side. Junkera is forced down low. We have a car sliding. Looks like Brian Herta threw the cake off to the inside. And at best, he brushed the wall if he even did that. Of course, yellow comes out immediately. Started. Now the car is nice and clean. Remember this year, they're running substantially less downforce than in previous years. Cold tires, lots of horsepower. It's easy once you pick up the throttle to spin the rear tires and have the car oversteer. 
You can see Brian coming through the kink. The back end gets loose. Paul, I think you're right. I don't think he touched anything. But we saw it, and especially the front tires were severely flat spotted. It looked like he may have gotten crowded down there along with uh, Cristiano D'Amata. And the car slides. And fortunately, he is able to get it under control on the exit to the uh, pit road and keeps the nose off the wall. So in the first quarter mile of the run, we have our first yellow. But in that same distance, Kenny Breck grabbed the lead away from pole sitter Junqueira. Welcome back to Nazareth Speedway. Paul Page with Parker John Stone. Uh, still under yellow, but actually a different reason now. We had first the spin of Brian Herta, and then as they were getting ready to go back to the green flag, Elio Castroneves got himself in trouble. Same problem as before with Brian Herta coming off the last corner. He picks up the throttle. Keep in mind, they've reduced the boost back to 37 inches, but they've regained all the power and more that the rules change was meant to eliminate. You can see cold tires, low down force, picks up the throttle, the back end steps out, and he catches it and continues full course yellow. And also, uh, that point on the track has been really the key problem for more most of the weekend. We'll elaborate on that in just a moment, but first let's go to Gary. Quick update on the radio from Castro Nevis to Tim Sindrick. He said, Helio said, I tried to pass. I shouldn't have tried that. He told us just before gentlemen start that he was going to take a very conservative approach. He says, Gary, I've had I've tried so hard in the last few years here, and I always get in trouble. Today, I'm going to sit and wait. And I said, you've been to the Rick Muir School of Racing. And he nodded and grinned and said, yes. But he got impatient already on that restart, and it has cost him. He's fortunate that he didn't get another car or the wall. Let's go to Jan. An update on Brian Herta. He made his way onto pit road. He had a 22-second pit stop where they were going to change the nose, but then they waved it off. They looked more closely, and they realized the damage on the front wings was limited to what they call the end fences, the end plates. And they decided that that wasn't worth changing. He has a fresh set of tires, and now hopefully he'll be able to get those warm before the next time we go back to green. So we were talking, Parker, about that part of the track where we just saw Elio Castro and Evis get in trouble. We've seen a lot of people get in trouble. It's right about here. Well, the problem is you come into this corner, very unusual for an oval, heavy braking and a downshift as you come off the corner. Particularly, we saw in that restart where you'll be in a lower gear, lots of torque, lots of horsepower. You step on the throttle, there's a bump as you come off that corner. That's all it takes to upset that fine balance. The car rotates right around. Well, let's uh, take you back and show you the little bit of racing we have had, and that is the start itself, where Kenny Breck just came screaming into the corner. He was side by side with Bruno and Bruno just got pushed down onto the rumble strips and Kenny Breck went right on by. And it was here then that uh, Brian Herta began his slide caused a little damage to the outside edges of his wing. This is rookie Scott Dixon who just came into the pits and almost immediately back out. Strategy they're at the back they qualify 23rd. They figured we might as well top up with fuel with now eight laps in the book. There's no reason to, you're not going to improve your position. So they're taking a chance now that a yellow will fall right at the right time later in the race and they'll gain track position. And they work to get realigned. Again, this is Scott Dixon. His teammate normally would be Mauricio Guzman in the 17 car, but Mauricio had a death in the family, his six year old son, Giuliano passed away it, it was not unexpected uh, they have been fighting an issue there for a long time but nevertheless they withdrew the car this weekend and our sympathies go out to Mauricio and the Guzman family Brian Herta back in for exactly the same reason we saw Dixon come in with his spin it dropped him towards the back he's now come in topped up for fuel and is getting out just in front of the pace car with one lap until the green. Brian's really going to have to hustle to get back that lap because that pit speed limit extends all the way to the end and the pace car nearly overtook him. He's going to have a real uphill battle now because the pace car is now pulled off the track. Brian's going to have to go just as hard as he can as Kenny Breck is only a few hundred yards behind him now with the green flag anticipated to be waved. 
We were looking at Christian Fittipaldi because there was a report that there was some smoke at the back of his car. Green flag comes out. This time, Kenny Breck got a good jump on the green and accelerates away. Serbia is second. Junkera is third. There's Tony Kanan and Cristiano Damata. Best friends off the track. Love to race one another on the track. In fact, Kanan now leads a little pack at seventh that begins to tighten up. first 23 cars in this starting field. While the track itself is difficult to pass, the drivers themselves are difficult to pass. That is to say that they are all so closely matched, there is good parity in the series, so it makes it very difficult, and you can really get in trouble if you don't plan your pass carefully, because if you get caught out, then you're really in trouble. Interestingly enough, on the first two laps after that restart, Oriol Servia, the fastest car on the track by a few tenths, when it, with this one small car team of Sigma Autosport, Oriol has impressed all year long. And now, once again with this lap, he is the quickest driver on the track. It's been a joy, especially, especially at Long Beach, to watch this team as they uh, watch that car do so very well. What about Christian Fittipaldi? Jan Vikas? Well, Paul, you were talking about smoke, and we saw the smoke here on pit road, at least behind the pace car. It seems as though it may have dissipated now. We checked with the crew. They checked the telemetry and said everything is A-OK -okay with the car. They're hoping maybe it was something temporary. Let's go to third place, Bruno Junqueira. Watch him as he chases Servia and Brett. Carpentier is behind Takagi. This is the closest battle on the track right now. The reason we're watching him now is a lap ago. Here's what happened is Takagi tried to pass on Tagliani, got way wide coming off, and bunched everybody up. Now the leader of the race, Kenny Breck, you see him there on the right. Closes on the back of the field. Now's when it gets a little dicey. And on that last lap, as they pass our position, one of the car's engines is starting to go off. Could be number 33 of team players trying to identify, but someone's obviously got a broken head or some other sort of engine problem. Looking down from the Honda Helicam, at the leader, trying to work his way through traffic now. We'll keep an ear out for Tagliani and what may be a problem with his engine. This is the fight for second place. Junquera trying to catch and pass Serbia. One of the things that makes this track so interesting and so technical is it climbs in elevation about 34 feet and then the back stretch the only real straight part there is on the track is all downhill. Parker it's quite a sensation you were talking earlier about roller coasters. Yes it's they come through the turns one two complex and head down this straightaway 
drivers are hard on the brakes. Usually they're downshifting if they're not trying to work out some different fuel strategy. Steepest part of the course here, six degrees banking, equivalent to the apron at Texas. Gives you an idea in the difference. Flat out through the kink once they have a little less fuel. And now they're climbing back uphill through turns one and two. It's very narrow here. Line of sight, very restricted. And now they dive 34 feet down this back straightaway, coming into turn number three. As you ride once again with Junkera and his chase of Serbia, right behind him, we showed him to you just a moment ago, is Michelle Jordan Jr. Young Mexican and the, and the team, they really put together, there he is, a good run this year. And they expect some great results. And this is where Nazareth gets interesting, as Kenny Breck works his way through traffic, if you're one of the following cars, if you're Serbia, Joncara, Jordan, down through the rest of the field, you're hoping to capitalize on your momentum here so that the leader or the driver that you're following gets bottled up. He has to lift. You can draft up and pass cleanly. And that's where it all comes together in Nazareth, is using the traffic to your advantage. Speaking to a lot of the drivers, they're wondering how Juncara and his teammate Manassian would react to such a busy environment where things are happening nonstop from beginning to end. So at Nazareth Speedway, 26 laps now into the record book. Kenny Brack, Oriole, Servia, Bruno Juncara, Michelle Jordan Jr., Servia, Juncara, Jordan. They all are battling one another while Breck tries to work his way through traffic. So far, it's been a pretty good year for Kenny. Welcome back to Nazareth Speedway. Coming up next, join ABC Sports for final round action of the Compact Classic of New Orleans. Next on ABC. Well, since we've been away, only one thing really has happened, and it happened to Patrick Carpentier. That engine sound that uh, we thought was going off song turns out to be Carpentier, and it turned out to be an engine, and it went big time. Jan? Yes, we're with Patrick at the moment. He has climbed from the car after lots of water to put out some flames. We heard a car go off song. Was that you? Sorry about that. We heard a car's engine go off song. That was yours? Yeah, at the beginning of the race, I uh, had absolutely no power, and it kept getting worse. I asked them to check the boost, because I thought it would be the pop-off the pop valve blowing off, but uh, it was not. The engine uh, went down, and then in the back, going on the back straight, I smelled something, I look in the mirror, saw the smoke, so I jump in the pits not to uh, stop the race. How's the wrist holding up? How's your wrist holding up? Uh, it was okay this weekend, let me tell you that uh, the wrist has been better than the car. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you. Remember, he broke his wrist in the uh, Toyota Grand Prix of Long Beach. We've got you back. Battle for fifth place. Watching Paul Tracy and Adrian Fernandez fight one another. Tracy's coming up. Of course, Paul Tracy has more laps around Nazareth than any of the other drivers. He tested time and time again here for Team Penske. He knows every inch of this place. Adrian Fernandez with his best qualifying effort of the year. Kind of a surprise. He picked up 12 miles an hour from Friday practice until qualifying, and that's turning out to be a good battle. And Cristiano D'Amata continues to hammer at Tony Kanan. This battle is for seven. And Frank Keaty right behind him trying to get into it, too. Gary? Quick update on Cristiano D'Amata, as well as his teammate Christian Fittipaldi. Both have been told that the mileage they are getting is good enough that they can go up one click on the boost. So apparently they're richening up the fuel, and maybe that little extra horsepower may enable D'Amata to challenge more effectively as he tries to advance from the eighth position, chasing Tony Kanaan. Kenny Breck has completed 39 laps, Parker. And the problem the drivers face here is with this Hanford device, it creates a lot of turbulence behind the cars. So even though Cristiano D'Amata might be able to run quicker, once he gets up behind three, four, or five car lengths behind Tony, he runs into this barrier where the turbulence doesn't allow him to optimize the aerodynamics of his car. And you can see that spread almost throughout the whole field. He's got to wait for the right timing so that Tony is bottled up in traffic. He can push the overtake button on the steering wheel, get maximum power out of his engine to try to capitalize on Tony slowing down to use his momentum to try to get by. Back on board with third place, Bruno Junqueira. Junqueira, a rookie, ahead of him, sophomore Oriole Serbia. The top four, in fact, have never won a kart race. You have to go all the way back to 17th to find the next non-winner. That would be Alex Tagliani. 
riding on board with Bruno. A huge difference between what we've seen earlier in practice and qualifying versus his current speed. Nearly 20 miles an hour. It's a much more relaxed pace. Don't get me wrong. These guys are driving these cars as hard as they can, but they're not shifting now with the changing track conditions that they have today. These long runs, they can't push the cars nearly as hard. And it's just surprising to me to see such a reduction in speed from even earlier this morning. Parker, from the pits, we were checking with the Firestone people, and we know on Friday when the ambient temperature was in the low to mid-90s here, track temperature got as high as 133. At the start of the race today, it was 21 degrees cooler in track temperature at 112. What does that do to the setup and the handling of these cars? Well, the poor drivers and engineers haven't had to work with the same track twice in a row the entire weekend. Very hot, as you said, on Friday. And that means that the air is less dense. The cars aren't producing as much downforce, but the tire temps come up right away. Patrick Carpentier told me that on Friday, within a lap and a half or two laps, he was right up to speed. So not as much downforce, but the tire temps are there. It gives the drivers a little better feeling, a little bit more security. Today, it's breezy, it's cool, as you said. The drivers, even after sustained long runs, are still trying to feel out what these cars are like on this ever-changing track condition. Much more difficult today, I would say, than it was earlier in the weekend. Kenny Breck continues to have to deal with traffic. Zanardi just ahead of him. And Zanardi oh. apparently didn't see him, just cut right across the front of him. Oh, he may have seen him, Paul. That was a fairly aggressive move. He doesn't want to go a lap down and just shut him down in the kink. Kenny obviously much quicker at this point. You can see Zanardi trying to take the inside line to shut Kenny off there. It's almost as though Kenny's got to back off a little bit, as he has use his superior speed, time it so that he can overtake him in exactly the right place. Watch Kenny, he's gonna get this set up, he's gonna take another run at him and try to time it so he can come off this corner and try to outbreak him going down into turn number three. He's looking, but he's not close enough now. He's gotta, it takes a few laps to try to figure out the timing. Obviously, Zanardi not giving anything away. He does not wanna go a lap down here. Morris Nunn on the radio just let Zanardi know that that is the leader who's now behind him. I wonder what that means to Alex. Well, if you ask him, he'd probably have a 20 or 30 minute answer for you. Here's the key to hold this. Servia and Junkera are closing. In fact, they gained a whole second on Breck while he's trying to fight with Zanardi. And as a driver, the problem you have is it's very easy to take on the rhythm of the driver in front of you. So that even though Kenny caught him very quickly, now he's fallen into the same pace, the same rhythm as Zanardi. And what he's got to do is remember who's the race leader here, who's the guy that's fastest, and just charge as hard as he can, unless he thinks that a pit stop will come soon enough where he won't have to deal with Zanardi on the track, but try to take care of him in the pit lane. So Kenny Breck has his problems trying to get around Alex Zanardi. At the same time, his competitors are closing in on him. That's Manassi and immediately behind Kenny Breck. It's two cars back until you see Serbia and Juncara. We'll be back after this message and a word from our ABC stations. Breck still hasn't gotten around Zanardi. You look down from high above the track, you get an idea of what an unusual oval this really is. And you can see why, while some people say there are three corners, one, two, and this would be three, there are others that will tell you there's one, two, three, four, and this one is five. And a lot of drivers refer to this track as a roval because it reminds them a lot of a road course, a very high-speed road course surrounded by concrete, and yet it is an oval. But certainly there's nothing traditional about it with its elevation changes and the varying corners here. It's very difficult for the drivers and teams if they get the car set up properly for turns one and two, and the car always has a big push coming off three and four. You get three and four right, the car's neutral to nervous going through one and two. So it's a constant juggling act, trying to find the best compromise for the best lap time. Well, while Kenny Breck has a problem with Zanardi, his teammate, Max Pappas, has a problem all his own. Jan, there's been a lot of radio talk going on there. Yes, and it has to do with not being able to shift. And I was interested, as Parker was, when we watched Bruno Junquera run around, that he was staying in one gear. Well, Max Pappas is staying in sixth gear because he has no choice. 
He has called in on the radio and said something has broken in the gearbox linkage and I have to stay in sixth gear. They do not know if he comes on pit road whether he will be able to somehow get it down into the gears so he can get it here on pit road and then leave. At the moment, they think that's not the case. In other words, it is stuck in sixth and they're going to have to fix it here when he makes his first stop. Well, Jan, I understand that uh, one of the two team owners, Dave Letterman, is here this weekend. Yes, he is here. Bobby Rahal is not. So Bobby Rahal's consecutive streak of, I believe, 307 races was broken. We thought with the postponement of Texas that he'd have another shot at keeping that streak alive, but he's not here this weekend. So Dave Letterman is at the helm and, of course, cheering this man on, Kenny Breck. Breck tries once again and once again can't get it done. All he needs is to get around Zanardi. Competition still closes. Again, there are a couple of cars that separate. If you look up, that's Finassian. Breck's going to try it to the inside. Because what's happening is that interval just a couple laps ago. There he goes. And finally, he got him. And that's the desperation from Kenny Breck because just a few laps ago, the interval back to Serbia was 3.3 seconds. It had come down to only two seconds. Kenny knew that he couldn't be patient any longer. He had to make that pass because he saw that interval closing to second place. And now he's hoping that Serbia has the same number of laps trying to get around Zanardi that he did. So now he can get away and try to build a cushion before this first round of pit stops. And yeah, now Kenny Breck will close on Scott Dixon, who started 23rd. You saw him get around Zanardi just before we went to break and now sits up in 20th. That was oh, close for Serbia. Serbia sliding by Max Wilson. This is Max's first oval race, and there's so much going on here. It's difficult to see where you're going while you're looking in the mirrors all the time, especially when you're back in Max Wilson's position of 23rd. And now Bruno Zunkera, third place, going to try to get around Wilson. So we're going to have two rookies try to contest one another. He tries to get a run down the back straight, outbreaks him on the way in. Nicely done that time, but I think Max was a little better prepared for being fast that time. And Serbia now has to take a look at the back end of Junkera's teammate, and that's Nicholas Manassian. There's Manassian. We'll go on board with him. And look back. As Serbia closes, and just behind him soon will be Junkera. Here's where you gotta wonder if uh, any two-way radio communication is going out. What's interesting is how different the lines are here for these two drivers. Remember, Serbia has always done extremely well at Nazareth in the past. In Indy Lights, the champion just a few years ago, he's won races here, qualified on the pole. Actually had a great battle with Cristiano D'Amata just a few years back. And there goes Serbia. But amazing difference in line. Serbia using up a lot more road, freeing the car up, especially coming off of turn two. And here off of turn four, Manassian pinching the car down a little bit, scrubbing more speed. Gives the driver a little less security. If he actually opened the, the, cor the corner up, straighten the wheel a little sooner, the car would feel a little better underneath him. Well, Kenny Breck has uh, come up on the back of another group now of four cars as we watch Tony Kanaan and Cristiano Damata. Zanardi. Zanardi slowed over on the back stretch. You can see a big difference in his defensive posture now, just letting cars slide by underneath him. Now, the question, of course, is why did he slow? Did he slow just to let somebody by, or does he have a serious problem now? I guess this next couple of moments will tell us. This is, look at this. This is all a fight for position, running right behind him. And here we've got a car in trouble, and that is Michelle Jourdain, Jr. Guy who started third, got it back under control, and back into the fight. But it's full course yellow, and the pits are alive now as everyone's setting up for this first round of pit stops. Completed 74 laps as we look again. Paul Tracy there on the back, but you see Jordan right on the front of the screen, losing it, coming off the final corner. We've seen that all weekend long. 
Does a nice job here. Keeps the steering lock in. Anticipates the car coming back straight ahead on the grass. That's a tricky bit of driving at 140 miles an hour plus as the car slowed down there. And essentially the same part of the track that we've been talking about. We've seen a good number of situations develop. Different problem here. He's probably a little over anxious to get on the throttle. There's a big bump coming off the corner. We could see everyone backed up. You could see Tracy putting the pressure on Fernandez behind him. He was trying to get up behind the car in front of him with the bottling up behind Zanardi, and he just looks like he picked the power up just a split second too soon. 900 horsepower, spins the rear tires, and around he, around he goes. But good bit of driving, keeping it off the wall, exiting that corner. Up and down the pits, the crews are already just waiting for the signal to let them into the pits. And now that they're gathered up, the pits are open. And as they come around, I think you're going to see most of the field come in for fuel and tires. Jan. Yes, and that would be the case for Kenny Breck. We check with the team. He's going to get four fresh tires, and they're only going to make a one-turn wing change on the front. So his car, obviously, we see the way it's running. It's very close, but still they want to fine-tune it a little bit. Gary? Whole new scenario for Bruno Giancara, who's running in the top three now, and car number four for Chip Ganassi on the radio saying, what do I do? Chip said, just pack up behind the car. They're going to go down one and a half turns on the wing. Here comes Breck going by us. There goes Serbia. Here comes Giancara. Oh, he's in hot, but he saves it. He may have, oh, he, he almost went too far. Very tight pits, 38 to 40 feet. They're backing Giancara up. And they'll complete the service, but this has taken much longer than they would have hoped. Let's go up to Dion. And our leader is here in eight seconds. As Tagliani pulls in, here goes Kenny Breck. He's got his changes. We're looking for Serbia, and he beats Serbia on the pit road. Well, more than enough action and more than enough noise as the leaders all come in to make their stops. One team, the Target Chip Ganassi team, split the stop. Wanting to get Junkera in and out before they brought Manassi and in. And Paul, here's what we thought about Max Pappas. He did not make it off of pit road. The crew is now pushing him back. That gearbox problem is, as we thought, unable to select the gears he needs. And a way to start. Okay, we're gonna try it. Max Pappas, you heard him say on the radio they're going to try and fix it here and now. Whether or not they can, that's an entirely different issue. And if they can, how long will it take to get it fixed? So with the caution out for Michelle Jordan Jr., who does get it back under control and drives it around, here is the stop of the race leader, Kenny Breck. Could he be on his way to his first kart victory? We'll see. It comes while we are still under yellow at Nazareth. Last week, CART made a sudden change of plans after determining they were not prepared to race at Texas Motor Speedway, forcing the postponement of the race. Well, the CART president and CEO, Joe Heitzler, explains what is necessary to get CART back to Texas. What Dr. Olvey told us was he felt that in the 220 to 225 range, we would take that lateral and that vertical G-force aspect out of it and uh, we'd want to test that extensively before we go back. And any further tests down there, we would involve uh, the astronaut doctor that consulted with us and others to make sure that it's a safe environment for our fans and for our drivers. Well, the Texas Motor Speedway is closed from June 9th through September 15th for renovations. That only leaves these dates available for a potential cart return. Well, that last round of stops had uh, quite an impact on the field. The pace car is already moving off the course. There's the pit summary. Junkera lost big time. So did Tracy. Looking for green. We've got it. We're back racing at Nazareth. Chases Oriel Servian. Kenny Breck has already pulled away about a half a straightaway. 
back in the field. They're nose to tail everywhere. Michael Andretti, first winner here under home in front of a hometown crowd. Michael lives uh, only about three miles away from this track. Gary Gerald. Interesting comments from Michael Andretti, who now has cracked the top ten, as you'd indicated, Paul. He's a little frustrated. He said the Firestone tires are simply too good. He was telling his crew on the radio, he said apparently the, the wear is so little that the guys up front aren't losing any grip, and he can't catch up with them. He's frustrated because the tires are too good. That's an unusual complaint coming from many of the guys. They're usually going exactly the other way. Max Pappas is out of the car with Jan Bikas. Yes, and they were unable to fix the car. Max, when did you first feel there was a problem with the gearbox? There's no problem with the gearbox. The cable uh, broke from the gear lever to the back of the gearbox, and uh, that put me off to the race. Very disappointed, you know, because uh, we had a very good car. I thought the Miller Light car was very good, but uh, you know, I went down to pass Michael on the start, and when I went to downship, the, the you know, the gear lever just went down, saying my hand almost crashed into Helio was in front of me, and that was it. All right, hope you have better luck in Japan. Thanks. We hope so. You know, it's not a very good stride for the Miller team, but uh, we're, we are upbeaten, we are strong, and uh, we're going to be come back. One of the cars we're going to be watching for you is the guy who came into this race as uh, second in the points, defending champion here, defending series champion, Jill DeFerrin. He came up to 13th. Just before the stop, he's now back in 19. And the start he made here today was his worst in two years. Gary Gerald is on his way to Team Penske trying to find out what the situation may be with Jill DeFerrin. Michael with Paul Tracy right behind him. Dario Franchitti, Tracy's teammate, just ahead of him. And I'd like to get back to the comment that Gary made about Andretti saying, hey, these guys, these guys' tire wear is too good. In years past, with Michael's vast experience, he knows exactly what the car has to feel like on full tanks, on fresh tires at the beginning of the race, so that it ends up exactly where he wants it at the end of the fuel run. Well, he was hoping that other drivers would not be able to hit the bullseye quite as accurately, and as the race progresses, would be able to pick them up one at a time as their car balance went off. Well, what he's saying now is everybody's been able to figure out what the car needs to feel like at the beginning of the runs, and because the car balance is, is not going off for the people in front of them, he's not being able to take advantage of that experience and work his way forward. Watching Bruno Junquera, there are reports from the observers that he may have taken something into the right side intake. Nothing seems obvious there. We're going to go on board. See how the engine sounds. The right side is the follow true to form. Well, there's some cooling over there. Most of it's over on the left side, but a lot of electronics over here on the right. Yeah, depending on the manufacturer and the team installation, though, a lot of the cars have large coolers, water, and oil on both sides of the car. It could be something as simple as a hot dog wrapper that's gone back down into the screen. Shouldn't be a problem in today's cool temperatures with an overheating problem. Gary Gerald, we were wondering about Jill DeFerrin. You headed right off for the Penske pits. Yeah, we found out that he actually stalled in these very tight quarters, and we should point out again that the pit stalls here at Nazareth are as small as anywhere on the circuit, 38 to 40 feet. He got bunched up, and as he tried to leave the pits, stall the engine. The time that he took the restart cost him several spots in position on the racetrack. Breck, Servia, D'Amato, Fernandez, the top four. And Kenny Breck now has, once again, traffic to worry about. And that car, two ahead, that's Alex Zanardi. Comes up to work on Brian Herta right now. No problem with Herta. 
You can see Herta checking his mirrors. You know he's a couple laps down. Let's Kenny by the inside. Very professionally done there. But this should be interesting. I think two-time champion Alex Sinardi doesn't let anyone through no matter where he's positioned on the track or how many laps he may be down. And if you're chasing Kenny Brack, if you're Oriol Servia, Cristiano D'Amata, Adrian Fernandez, you know that the leaders now bunched up in traffic are going to drive as hard as you possibly can to try to take advantage of the situation. Sinardi once again. And I gave him room. A little bit. That was sort of a car width minus an inch, I think. And so Kenny Brack gets around Sinardi this time. Lap 104. Kenny Brack will have led exactly half of the total laps run this season. He currently is the leader. Fords are in the top two spots. Welcome back to Nazareth. Well, Don Prudhomme's team is on a three-race win streak. One of his dire drivers, Larry Dixon, is the top qualifier and top fuel at the Advance Auto Parts NHRA Southern Nationals today at 5 p.m. Eastern on ESPN2. Our first Toyota Spotlight, we're going to take a look at the weekend of Max Pappas. It has not been a pleasant one. Yesterday morning during the practice, he lost control, caught the car, kept it under control, and drove it in safely. Then in qualifying, pretty much the same thing. Lost the car, kept it under control, backed it right up to the warm-up road. Then today, well, with the gear cable went away, so did his race. Tough day for Max Papp. Kenny Breck, still the leader of the run here. 108 laps now complete. Serbia still runs in second, but Breck has to deal with traffic. And part of the problem with traffic, as with all competition, especially on a tight oval like this with an open-wheel car and the aerodynamic package, the cart currently has on their cars. Right now, Breck is feeling a lot of the aerodynamics of the car in front of him. Because of coolers, because of aerodynamics, he really doesn't want to close up behind the car in front of him. Brian Herta into the pits. Remember, he had his problem very early in the race, went off schedule, topping up with fuel, trying to get a lap back, looking for a yellow, didn't come, so he's now in under the green. the grass and then continued on I just caught a, a flicker out of the corner of my eye I'm not sure if it was a full spin or he just ended up down there that brings out the caution once again Kenny Breck's lead is still protected the top three are Breck Serbia and Cristiano D'Amata report now is he did spin but like uh, most this weekend got it under control. The only exception to that was Nicholas Manassian, who got it into the wall. There it is. Same place, coming off the last corner, on the power, over the bump, back in, steps out, catches it, drives it down the warm-up lane, and back out onto the track. So fortunately for Tora Takagi, everything is good there as well. The pace car slows to pick up the leader of the race, and that is still Breck. Now with Zanardi right on top of him. 
one of the advantages of going to this low down force package just a few years back is in years past with the increased cornering speeds with the road course wings on that spin or a loss of control would have ended up in a big crash on the outside wall. Now the drivers have a little better feel. They're going slower through the corner. So when the back end does step out, as we've seen this weekend, with the exception of Manassian, who crashed at the other end of the track, every driver's been able to recover from the loss of control and continue on. We're winning. It may be a possibility that Cristiano DeMata will pit. If he does, he will come in out of third place to do so. Paul, this could be one of those situations where somebody's just setting up a fake and they're waiting to see whether or not the leader comes in. If the leaders come in, you can be sure that most of those front runners, I think, will top off. But it could be just one of those situations, uh, monkey see, monkey do. Vassar turns in. Here comes Tracy. Bruno Junquera comes in. Well, after this stop, they'll have to do 109 laps. And that's going to be some phenomenal fuel mileage if they're if they're going to try that well over 2.7, 2.8 miles per gallon. Well, Bruno got it stopped in the right place this time, eh, Gear? Well, Tracy is in, and they are changing tires, which somewhat surprises me. He's gone. Vassar beat him out, and I think that blue and white car I saw flash by might have been Andretti, but I'm not certain about that. Actually, it was Alex Tagliani, Gary. He just leaves here, same thing, fresh set of tires. Looks like Christian Fittipaldi just beat him out. So we've got some interesting strategy now beginning to play. 13 of the cars came into the pits at that time. So we'll see, especially with a couple of them going to tires, exactly what's going to happen. 117 of the 225 are complete. We'll be back after this message and a word from our ABC station. Well, back at Nazareth Speedway, while we were away, they brought the green flag out again, and then almost immediately ended up with two cars together. It's Carpentier and Jill DeFerrin. Excuse me, Tagliani and Jill DeFerrin. Coming down into turn three, DeFerrin looking down on the inside. Tag turns towards the apex. They make contact right front to left rear, spinning both cars into the wall. Both cars catching the wall with the uh, side which is a better hit always more cushioning over there first reports are that everybody's okay as they get Jill DeFerrin out of the con out of the car you can see he's wearing the Hans device this is the uh, first race that they've actually run that it has been mandated Tagliani there they're working with him still trying to get him clear of the car Cart safety team. Lon Bromley, the head of the safety team, straddling the car, looking down, and directing the overall operation rescue there for Tagliani. You can see the distance on entry between the two cars. That's right in the blind spot for Tagliani. He won't be able to see Jill in his mirror. Tag turns down towards the inside of the corner. The problem with leaving that much room for DeFerrin is he thinks that Tagliani is inviting him down to the inside for whatever reason. So the pit strategy becomes important now as we watch to see how Tagliani is. And we'll look at it from Bruno Junquera's point of view. Remember, this is the principal passing area. They're hard on the brakes. They're downshifting. You can see the contact made. And unfortunately, from a racing a racer's aspect, you say, great, well, there's two less guys in the race. Obviously, you don't want anyone hurt. It's just two more cars you don't have to deal with in traffic. So very frustrated. Jill DeFerrin, the defending champion, not only in the series, but of this race, is out. 123 laps complete. They're going to bring them through on the warm-up lane so that they have plenty of room to get the safety equipment around and get the track itself properly cleaned up and do whatever work is necessary with Tagliani. We'll try to get an update on him just as soon as we can. It's still Kenny Breck. He's led all the way and still Fords at the top. We'll be back. Well, back in Nazareth, Pennsylvania for the Kart FedEx Championship Series, the Nazareth 225. They're still working over at the car of Alex Tagliani. And they have reported there is an injury, but it's not life-threatening. We'll wait for a uh, further 
resolve on that situation. Here's how both Tagliani and DeFerrin got into the wall. And you can see with Tagliani's car, it backed in at a very steep angle, slapping the right front corner of the car hard into the wall. So with the yellow out for this and them circulating the field on the warm-up lane, Kenny Breck had it down into the pits along with several others as that strategy began to play out. Jan Bikas was right there. Yes, I was. When Kenny Breck came in, it was a 7.8 second stop. Scott, do you have a minute to Scott Remke, general manager? Why stop now? I'm sorry, what's why stop now? What's the strategy? Stopped off, see if there's some yellows, go to the end. How much yellow do you need to make it to the end now? They're calculating all that right now. We were pretty close to our window. All right. A big surprise up and down pit road. Leader ducking onto pit road with no radio communication. They surprised everybody, and they hope now they got enough fuel to make it to the end, guys. Well, they gave up substantial track position from the lead back to 10th, giving the lead over to Tony Kanaan, but the strategy might be pretty cool. I think the strategy's perfect. We've heard reports that some of the drivers are getting 2.7 miles per gallon. That means they can go exactly 100 laps, and when they came in, they were at lap 125. You add the laps together, they're exactly in the right spot. I think Team Rahal has done a brilliant job of strategy. Another guy that came in at the same time was Cristiano Damata, Gary. Yeah, routine service topped him off, changed tires, sent him back out, and it's the exact same strategy. And they've already told him on the radio, conserve as much fuel as you possibly can. Oriel Servius crew has told him on the radio that he's got enough to go the distance. And we are now, what, 97 laps away from the end? That's a stretch. They're going to need a bunch of yellow in order to make it that far. And even driving around very slowly, what those drivers are doing is they've got it up in fourth, fifth, sixth gear. It leaned out completely, and as long as the engine will continue to chug along at very low RPM, they don't care because they can double, even triple their mileage during these yellow flag laps. Well, Parker, you're talking, yes, Paul, you're talking about tripling mileage. Uh, you know, we talked about this, I think it was last year here at Nazareth. When you run around in the warm-up lane, you're covering a much shorter distance than you are if you're out on the racetrack, so that's just a little added bonus when it comes to your fuel saving. And we saw the tire changes as well, so we know they're good for tires. We've also heard these tires aren't wearing very much, but it's no problem here today. This mobile update focuses on Kart Speeder Series. Andy Lines, they've raced three times this season, starting in Mexico, where Derek Higgins took the checker. In Long Beach, Mario Dominguez had the pole, but Townsend Bell worked his way up the line to six and to first, capturing his first win. And finally in Texas, though Kart didn't run, Indy Lights put on a spectacular show where Mario Dominguez and Rudy Junko got together just as Damien Faulkner took his first checkered flag. There's the current standings in the Dayton Indy Lights Championship Series. ABC's Ian Baker Finch gives all the happenings around the course online at ESPN.com. Keyword, ABC Sports. Nazareth still under the yellow. Gives us a chance for a Toyota Spotlight. Takes a look at a safety development this year, the Hans device. It's been made mandatory this year on all of the oval tracks. Helps maintain the driver's head during an impact. It worked for Mauricio Guzman during the practice at Texas Motor Speedway. And today, in the crash that just happened, of course, both the drivers, Tagliani and Jill DeFerrin, were wearing the Hans device. And the cleanup's still underway. We wait for some sort of definitive word on the condition and the nature of injury to Alex Tagliani. He's been taken to the medical center here. Card safety team, the best in the world. And on the last set of stops, uh, here's how and where they stopped and why the strategy now is going to become so very interesting. Well, Kanan, Frankiti, Nakano, they all have to come back in before the end of this race. Tracy, Dixon, Vassar, and the rest of the group, well, if they have enough yellow, they might be able to sneak this out with the kind of mileage they're getting now during this full course yellow. But certainly, Breck, Serbia, Fernandez, and that group, they're good to go to the checkered flag. So, Kanan, Frankiti, Nakano, Paul Tracy, Scott Dixon, those are the top five as we show you the field. We'll be going away when we come back. We hope to see some racing. We'll be back after these messages and a word from our ABC stations.
Well, we're still under yellow at Nazareth Speedway. There's the current standing. We're under yellow because of an accident involving Jill DeFerrin and Alex Tagliani. And so, Gary Gerald, the question has been, how is Alex? Well, we'll find out. Dr. Stephen Olvey, who is the director of uh, safety for Clark, can you tell us about uh, how our drivers are doing? Yeah, Gary, both drivers are okay. Uh, Jill's getting some ice, so he won't be stiff and sore because he plans to practice at Indianapolis later today, and we're doing the same thing for Alex. But uh, both of them got away with it and are, are doing fine. Hans device, how much in your mind does it help in situations like this? Well, there's no question it helps. Neither driver had any complaints in the neck or head area, and I think uh, that's kind of a testament to the Hans device. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. Brian Herta has just climbed out of the car and out of the race. And there again. And they've got to learn how to take the Hans device off gracefully, though, don't you think, Parker? I think that's going to take a little bit of work, but it's too bad for Brian Herta. Excellent qualifying effort in seventh. Spoke to his engineer, Lee Dykstra, the other night, and he said, hey, look, this guy's great on the streets and road course, but he's also outstanding on the ovals. My job is to show the world that. We're watching Roberto Moreno because, uh, again, the track observers reported that there was some smoke at the back of his car, and we're not sure what it is. Brian Herta, now with his helmet off, is with Jan Bikas. Yes, Brian, I know this day didn't get started the way you wanted. First of all, what happened on the start? I'm not really sure, Jan. I mean, it was, it was tight down there going in the first corner, and a couple of guys checked up on the brakes, and... I checked up, and I'm not sure if just checking up got me loose or if I actually got in contact with one or two of the guys around me, but the car just swapped ends, and we had some damage on the front end of the car from that, from the front wing, and you know, we were trying to soldier around, and then <clears throat> then uh, the clutch broke. We, we made a couple of stops uh, with the clutch broken and started making some noises out there under yellow, and, you know, we were already three laps down. We weren't sure what was going to happen, so, you know, it's... I'm so disappointed, especially for these guys. But, you know, we had a good car, and, you know, all we can do is go to Japan now and try and get them there. All right, we'll see you there. Thanks. Well, the two team green cars, Dario Franchitti and Paul Tracy, have steadily worked their way up. Franchitti is second, Tracy is fourth. Gary, what's going on with Team Green? Well, we checked uh, before that yellow, Paul, with uh, Barry Green. We're saying, Barry, what's up with the strategy? Why did you bring your guys in? Uh, this far away and he said well we can't pass on the racetrack we were struggling there we thought we'd just gamble and try to go for position just trying to shake it up trying to do anything and right now anything may be paying off big time they were the first in with the yellow ahead of that other group that's come in to top off so fuel will be very sketchy but of course every one of these laps under yellow certainly helps them in that department with 86 laps left every lap under yellow certainly is a help though not a help as much as it used to be in the old days as we look down from the Honda Helicam with uh, with the management systems now on the engine uh, the yellows aren't all that much they actually uh, they actually run the engine pretty efficiently at all times they do the biggest problem that the team green drivers Tony Kanan and the others face at the lead of this group is that fuel is horsepower and if they have to get 10 percent or more better mileage that means they're going to suffer the consequences in horsepower loss now the big question is though will that keep the group behind them behind them can the guys use that additional horsepower because they topped off later to actually make a pass stick here at nazareth that's going to be the big question we actually have three different races now happening within this race with three distinct strategies as you watch on board from Scott Dixon, all of those strategies come down and begin to show themselves about the last 10 laps of the race. Well, I think in this case, what we're going to see is that the guys that are led by Kenny Braxton, Kara, Serbia, Damata, and that group have to start pushing now. They're down in ninth place, and getting through this upper group is going to be quite the chore. Well, and as the strategy continues to play, here is Dario Franchitti on the pit road. His team laid out for him just a moment ago. And we assume this is a fuel topping. Franchini came out of second place for this. Now they're going for the right front for the all four. Four tire change. There's the fuel. And Franchini's away. So they, they move Tracy now up one position to fourth, depending on where Franchini comes out. Well, the problem Dario's got, Paul, is that pit speed limit, instead of ending at the last pit like it normally does at other tracks, goes all the way around the warm-up lane. And unfortunately, the pace car is driving faster than the 50-mile-an-hour speed limit. It's going to drop Dario well to the back of this pack. 
Dario last stopped on the 76th lap. And then he stopped again just now. That gives you some idea, too, of how far they can go. Jan Bikas. Remember, Paul, last time we were under caution, we had heard that Christian Fittipaldi car appeared to be smoking well we've had that same report again check again with Newman Haas and they say that according to the telemetry as far as the engine is concerned everything is a-ok -okay. they're not exactly sure why it seems to surface under caution their guess is that the weight checker is not working that's a hydraulic system to change the weight of the corners that the driver can do from the cockpit they think maybe that has sprung a leak and just tends to smoke under caution periods so it'll be Tony Kanan leading Sinji Nakano and Paul Tracy, and then rookie Scott Dixon back to the green flag. Jimmy Vassar is fifth. Green flag is out. Here we go again. Whoa, close fight back there is Kenny Breck. Tries to come up through this field just as fast as he can and goes around Michelle Jordan Jr. And that's what I thought would happen. Kenny and the group following him can't wait. I think they've got to go now, Paul, because these laps will wind down very quickly. And as difficult as it can be to pass here at Nazareth, he's got to take advantage of the fuel and horsepower and get that those passes done as quickly as possible. Christian Fittipaldi just ahead of him. Don't count out Jordan. He's very definitely been in this fight the last several races. Fittipaldi closes on Vassar. Vassar is fifth. Here's Tony Kanan at the front with Sinji Nakano right behind him. And those two at the front of the field on that last lap, the only two cars in the 22-second bracket, substantially quicker than everyone else. So running in clean air is definitely advantage at this point. Everyone else experiencing a lot of turbulence behind these cars. Right in here, fifth through ninth, this is where the action has to come now. You're right with Junquera, he's ninth. That's Jordan Jr. just ahead. See a little twitch of the hands under braking. The back end stepping out just a little bit. Nice correction there. Once again, I'm surprised no shifting happening. It obviously has a top gear that's working exactly the way he wants it to. The Toyota engine in this target Chip Ganassi car pulling well. Fuel position five. Put it on the pit board, Rob. Now there's a report that uh, Tracy's engine might be in trouble. Let's move from Junquera. We want to take you forward to fourth place, Scott Dixon. During the early parts of the race, he was doing a lot of shifting. And he still is. That's interesting. Both of these cars powered by Toyota. It could be that just Junquera is carrying enough speed through the corners where the Toyota engine isn't falling off the power band. Dropping now down Nakano to... moves on Tony Kanan, tries for the lead, can't do it. And a great battle there, two Renard chassis, both powered by Honda. Paul Tracy comes in, we're still trying to give a listen to his engine. We've talked about Toyota, the big surprise last week at Texas, of course, was Ford, who dominated in qualifying. Much, actually, a surprise to just about everyone, having just a huge amount of horsepower. They've been very quick this weekend as, as well, but it's been the Lola chassis that's been the dominant chassis regardless of the power plant. And now we see these two Honda Renards at the front. Gives you an idea of how competitive this series is in all aspects. Nakano steps out and tries, can't do it. And that's what Tracy wants. He wants him to get bottled up with Kanan so then he can make a move on Shinji or even Tony. Battle of the chassis. Here, Reynard's been concerned about the abilities of their car to race. Keep in mind that that's a little skewed with the different pit strategies we have right now. The Lolas have been so good, not only on the ovals, which everyone predicted during winter testing, but also on the road courses. 
Cristiano Damata giving him their first win of the season at the season opener in Monterey. Now Dixon closing in on Tracy. Fourth place. As the lead pack begins to bunch. Here comes Vassar, Fittipaldi, and Kenny Breck. Entire front of the field beginning to compress now, but again, different cars, different strategies. All of them coming to figure out in about 61 laps as we enter the last 10 laps of the race. We've got 16 cars on the lead lap, any one of which, including the rookies in this field that are so impressive and so strong that can win this race given the right opportunities and strategy. Look at the difference in line there. Paul Tracy much wider coming off of turn four. As I said earlier, if anyone knows the way their way around this track, it would be Paul Tracy. If I were Scott D Dixon, I'd be taking notes right now. Tracy, of course, along with Michael Andretti, two of the seniors in the series, with miles and miles behind them. And great knowledge, Tracy, especially of Nazareth because all of the testing he did here with the Penske organization at the line. And not really surprising. Sitting back there, Christian Fittipaldi is running fast. He's got a little bit of a gap. He's closed that up now. And Tony Kanan in front at second quick. Newman Haas team struggled a little earlier in the weekend. Bolting on lots of different development bits with every session. Both he and his teammate Cristiano Damata getting stronger as the weekend progressed. Right now, Bruno Giancara turned the quickest lap of the race much earlier. But these guys are sustaining the speed lap after lap after lap. Very impressive. On board with fourth place, the rookie Scott Dixon in front of him. The three Hondas, and then Scott and his Toyota will be back. Back at Nazareth Speedway, there the current standings. You'll notice that Breck is now fifth. While we were away, he just suddenly lit the wick and came charging as hard as he could. Here's how it happened. Exit First speed. Was this move on Christian Fittipaldi. Exit speed and horsepower. He goes around Christian Fittipaldi on the outside of the king. A very, very prodigious move. Jimmy Vassar was next. Once again, remember, these strategies are now playing out. He just powers right by Vassar. And now. At the front of the field, Nakano sticks his nose right up underneath Tony Kanan's wing. And Kenny Breck has made it now around Paul Tracy. This so is the strategy playing out, as we said. There's more fuel available, more horsepower. Kenny Breck, the dominant driver with Team Ray Hall since the beginning of the season, says, this is my race, I want it, and I'm coming forward now. And now it's rookie Scott Dixon, currently third, that Breck has in his sights. Indianapolis champion, IRL champ, but he's yet to win in the Kart FedEx Championship Series. This is his 23rd start in this series. What you just heard is they're going up on fuel and use the button. That means the overtake button puts it at full mixture, full advance on the timing. They get fuel, full horsepower, although the fuel mileage goes way down. That tells you they've got plenty in supply, a big surplus for Kenny Breck to continue his charge forward. Breck is fourth. But remember once again, with now 55 to go, the different fuel strategies that are here. All of them to play out right at the end of the run. Got a couple of fuel estimates that we're working on. First of all, we'll show you Tony Kanan. Should be in pretty quick. Black flag been displayed to Alex Zanardi, bringing him in. What's interesting is Kenny Breck has charged through 
Following him a little bit in arrears is Jourdain, Junqueira, Servia, Damata, and the rest of the group. But Kenny Breck, on the same fuel strategy as the rest of those drivers, has made it very clear that through aggressive driving, he's able to make passes in places that I didn't think was possible just an hour ago. For Zanardi, the black flag was a uh, stop and go pit speed violation. He inches his way forward now on Scott Dixon. And Scott Dixon, no pushover. The Indy Lights champion from last year. Very, very good driver here, driving for Bruce McCaw and the Pac West team. I do want to show you how Brett got by Paul Tracy. Well, let me tell you. Paul Tracy. Oh, no. <laughs> Paul Tracy said you can have it, but if you want it, you're going to work for it, Kenny. And Kenny did. Great little catch, too. Back line, Breck closing on Dixon. But what's interesting here, Paul, is it looks like Scott Dixon is quicker through the kink. That is the, the bend just past start finish. With this reduced arrow load, it's difficult for the drivers to do it flat. Everything has to be just right. It'll be interesting to see with this onboard if we can hear the engine and see if the fact that he is going through the kink flat because he is gaining ground at Kenny at that point on the racetrack. It has now been 100 laps, just under 100 miles, since Tony Kanan and Sinji Nakano, first and second, have pitted. Coming off the last corner, let's listen to the engine now. Now he's got a pretty sizable lift going through the kink, but it's not apparently as much as Kenny's. This is pretty much what Dixon is seeing in his rearview mirrors. And unfortunately for him, it's that glimpse from time to time of Breck, but he's holding them off pretty well. He's doing an outstanding job. I'm actually a little surprised as we can see Paul Tracy now starting to come up behind Kenny Breck. I don't know if Kenny's had a balance change. We suggested Jan Vikas that Sinji ought to be in just any time now. Yes, he has missed the pits twice. Tom Anderson on the radio screaming, pit, 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 because he is desperately low on fuel. He doesn't hear the radio call. He'll fuel the engine any moment. Yeah, we predicted five laps, and now we've got him on empty. Keep in mind, the drivers do have a fuel counter on their display. They give them a number that's taped to the steering wheel that says, hey, if this counter gets to this number, you better be on the way into the pits. But this is such a busy place. Shinji in second now. He's got his hands full. He probably doesn't have time to look down. But as Jan said, any moment now, the engine's going to announce that it's out of fuel and his race is over if he does not come into the pits. And, of course, if he does that and the car stays out in harm's way... Tom Anderson, one of the owners, oh. he still keeps it out. I was going to say, if he stops out there on the track, that'll bring out a yellow, and then all the strategies go again. Breck looks inside of Dixon. Now, they have radio communication. The driver has the fuel display. They also have pit boards hung out over the uh, outer wall of the pits. And finally, Sinji got the message. I can only guess that the fuel alarm started blinking and it finally got his attention. So as Sinji Nakano comes in, Jan Bikas waits for him. And they're going to go ahead and change some tires here as well, Paul, which is somewhat surprising. I thought they'd just dump some fuel in and get him out of here. But they're going to go ahead and change four tires. And the thing's still running, so he did have some fuel. <laughs> Not the fastest stop in the world, but thankfully, he got the fuel he needed. Well, we would expect that Tony Kanan would be in shortly as well. I'm sure they decided to go ahead and put tires on because it wasn't going to matter much if they stopped him with a quick stop and go or if they put the tires on because, as you mentioned earlier, the roll in and roll out. Gary Gerald. Well, we were just checking on Scott Dixon, the former Indy Lights champion from a year ago, and his rookie season with these guys. And Russell Cameron, who's normally hooked up with Mauricio Guzman, just told us, no, we're good to go the distance. We thought he was going to have to come in to top off for fuel, but they're saying that's not the case. Well, and that's great news for Scott Dixon. Tony Kanaan is the one that we do expect in. 
And here comes Kenny Breck, now third, with Sinji Nakano stop. And still working on Dixon, though this time it's a battle for second. Don't count out Paul Tracy and Jimmy Vassar. They're there. So is Christian, Fittipaldi, Jordan Jr., Junqueira, Servia, and D'Amata all within a straightaway of one another. run out of fuel and Russ Thompson our statistician up here is calculating that Kanan has run a considerable distance maybe as many as 109 laps but the pit saying no we're not going to stop him anytime soon we'll do some checking on that well Tony Kanan the leader Scott Dixon sitting in second it's Honda Toyota four top three Well, figuring out where to put commercials in a race like this is a tough job, and the truck's been doing the best they can. Scott Dixon now has the lead. Kenny Breck into second, and why? We were right thinking about Tony Kanaan. Despite the fact his crew suggested they were going to keep him out for a while, his engine decided it wanted a little more methanol if it was going to do that. As he, slowed, as he slowed, Scott Dixon took over the lead. And then as he headed for the pits, Kenny Breck thought he'd go to the inside. Well, wrong place to go. He had to sweep back to the outside and stay in second place ahead of Paul Tracy. But now he's climbing all over the back of Dixon. And Dixon should be pretty close on fuel, too. He sure should. The logic here is, is that if Nakano's got a Honda and Kanan's got a Honda and they both come in at the same time and Nakano comes back in for at the end of his fuel run, that obviously Kanan's got to be coming in sometime soon. Well, Scott Dixon came in as the same as that group. He must be making fuel out there. One thing I've noticed, though, with Kenny Breck is his car looks extremely loose. That's why I think his hard charge in the beginning must have put a premium of wear on those rear tires, and that's why we're not seeing him attack aggressively with Scott Dixon. But Scott Dixon has got to come into the pit lane sometime soon. So 197 laps complete. We're working 198. They're 25, 20, uh, 27 to go. And the front of the field is the rookie, Scott Dixon, who started 23rd with Kenny Breck chasing him. Jill DeFerrin, defending champion of this event, is out. He's with Gary Gerald. He's back in the transporter, Paul, and he's already starting to disrobe here because he's got another appointment later today at Indianapolis. The important thing, how do you feel, and what can you tell us about that incident with Tagliani? Well, I feel fine, Gary. Thank you very much. And. Uh... You know, despite the, it was quite a heavy accident, but the head protection that, that really helped me there. So I'm in fantastic shape. As far as the accident goes, uh, I had a run uh, coming off uh, two into Tagliani, and I saw an opportunity there. I dove in, and I was, uh, you know, halfway in there. I guess he decided to, to close the door there, but I couldn't back out of it. I was committed, and. Uh, and then we touch, then see you later. Now, what's the plan in terms of trying to get to Indianapolis to run before the day is complete, before they hit 6 o'clock there at the Speedway? Uh, we just want to get the car shaken down so we get a good start tomorrow. So uh, try to get back to, uh, tonight as soon as we can. Travel safely and good wishes. Thank you. Scott Dixon continues to carve his way through traffic around Nicholas Manassian. Kenny Breck goes low on Manassian as the front of the field overhauls the slower car. And the question remains now with the final laps beginning to run out. Who has fuel and who doesn't? Here's the last set of stops. Dixon on 116. Breck much later. Well, obviously, Kenny should have a horsepower advantage, but once again, it looks like he is really hanging on to this Team Ray Hall car. We've seen and we know how quick Kenny's hands are and his ability to drive a car that's neutral to lose. And I think at a place like this, if a car starts to go loose on you, every time you turn the steering wheel, the car is trying to swap ends. And I think Kenny's just holding on, trying to push Scott into a mistake. We know how good this rookie is, and I don't think that's likely to happen. It's going to be all about fuel at the end. Well, and on the fuel, looking at those numbers, then Scott Dixon 
probably be on fumes at the finish, but he may be able to make the finish. Jan Vikas. Well, Parker, you were talking about the looseness of Kenny Breck, and we just had a good display of that as he went through the kink here on the front straightaway. And at his final pit stop, they added front wing. And I think the reason was is that they knew that they were going to be running in traffic, and that's when you need some more front wing. Now that he has to stand on it and try and really race to go to the lead, I think that's what's making the car loose. These things are so sensitive. I think you're exactly right, Jan. The longest day of my life came here at Nazareth a few years back. We're on the green flag lap. I was absolutely full opposite lock sideways as I went through the kink on lap one, and then the car went loose from there. I said, oh, please, I just want to go home. So Kenny obviously doing everything he can. Scott Dixon driving at, as hard as he possibly can, conserving fuel, and just keeping Kenny Breck behind him. Magnificent job for two completely different reasons from both of these drivers. Scott Dixon still leading it, Gary. Yeah, we go inside 20 laps to go, and there's nothing but optimism down here. We heard one report to indicate that he is running full rich, so he's got plenty of fuel to go, and that's amazing when you consider that that stop came, I think you said, at one, lap 112 or 116. This may be the longest run we've ever seen here at uh, Nazareth in the 15 years the Champ Cars have been running here. Max Wilson tried to swing out of the way, and almost put Dixon in trouble. He recovered nicely, then got around Manassian. Now Breck has cleared Manassian as well, and Tracy comes up to clear him. And just below our position are all the spotters for the teams, and we're doing a little bit of let's make a deal here. As the leaders are coming through the slower traffic, there are some conversations just below us. Of, hey, can you give us a break? Can you move out of the way? We're coming, because it's really going to help our cause. You don't know if maybe some favors called in now will play out in the championship as the year goes on. There's first and second. There's third off the corner and fourth, Jimmy Vassar. All within a very short straightaway of one another. I spoke to Jimmy earlier today, and he said, I've got a car that can win this race. Coming through the field might be a problem, but he said the car was very stable. Another guy like Michael Andretti with just a wealth of experience, very successful on the ovals and know exactly what the car needs in order to get the finish line at the front. This is playing out well for Pat Patrick, his team, and Jimmy Vassar. And they are getting, we are told, 2-4 uh, two, two to 2-6 per gallon, and they're good for the rest of the distance, so it's a very impressive run for these Pat Patrick drivers. Jimmy Vassar closing a little bit on Tracy now. And you look to the corner. He was a little closer last time by. So first through fourth, actually through fifth, Michelle Jourdain Jr. Separated, but running as hard as they can. You consider the front of the field while we watch both Tracy and Vassar. We're going we're to move back up to the front. What a great story it would be for Scott Dixon and his team, Pac West. Remember that uh, Mauricio Guzman is the teammate here, and all the trouble he had last week, the loss of the car, and the tragedies that he suffered this week. That would be a that would be a wonderful victory for this rookie. There's Bruce McCaw from the Pacific Northwest, the owner of the team. Remember their last win came at the Fontana race in 1997 at the hands of Mark Glendell. So it's been a while. They've had a dry spell. This team just keeps plugging away, though. As you've said, this rookie, very, very good. Jan Vikas, Dave Letterman's there watching, running, I assume, part of the team. What does he think about Breck? Well, I tell you, it doesn't get any better than this, Paul. They're just glued to the monitor, watching every move for Kenny Breck as he tries to work his way back. Max Wilson, from a team owner standpoint, yellow flag yellow just we'll come came back. out. Okay, Dave. Yellow flag came out. Looks like Jordan. Jordan. Yep. Spins it, catches it, continues. Yeah, yeah. This is the second time for him today in the same spot that's caught everyone else. Coming down into the final corner, hard on the brakes. You roll in, six degrees of banking. And as you pick the power up coming off the corner, watch the back end of the car step out. He stands on the throttle, an excellent maneuver. Oh. Whoa, that was close with Christian Fittipaldi. If he would have hit the brakes, it would have taken him right into the outside wall. Perfect driving. He was running fifth. He's dropped to at least 13th. Yellow out. We'll be back after this. 
at Nazareth Speedway, the pace car accelerates away from the field. Green flag in the hands of the starter. We're ready to go back to green flag racing. A rookie has to bring him back. He's got to figure all of this out now if he wants to win. And he does a pretty nice job of it as Dixon accelerates away from second place Kenny Breck. if and we're absolutely sure it is if fuel was a factor. We can still see Kenny working the wheel. Keep in mind during that yellow, he's maximized the weight jacker, the anti-roll bars in the car, everything he can to get the looseness out of this car. We can still see the back of the car is quite, quite nervous. Boy, think about Dixon. You got one of the best oval racers in the business right behind him. Dixon seems to be able to put that sort of thing out of his mind, though. Gary Gerald? Well, that's exactly the point I wanted to make. You know, watching him come up and run in the Indy Lights the last couple of years, and Jan and I have been close to that series as we cover all of their events, Scott Dixon was almost unflappable, and sometimes you wanted to say, show us some emotion. But this kid isn't a kid behind the wheel of a race car. He's remarkably composed, and he just he takes things so matter-of-factly, it seems, and yet he's intense on the racetrack. An amazing job. And holding off Kenny Wreck under this scenario here with less than four to go, in my mind, is just astounding. First through fourth are right together. Let's just watch. this race rpm will and have it on rpm tonight white flag will come out to scott dixon the rookie trying to score a win on an oval let's see if he can do it kenny breck is right there traffic just ahead he's just got to negotiate this traffic kenny breck drops back a little bit kenny breck moves to the inside now takes the sweep to the outside. Doesn't look like it's going to happen for Breck, but it will happen for Scott Dixon. The rookie becomes the 46th right driver to win in car. Good job, Bill. Beautiful. He scores his win in his third start. The fifth win for Pac West. Let's go to Gary Gerald. Bruce McCall being go, congratulated by this crew. You can hear the radio in the background. Everybody coming over to congratulate 97 Fontana the last time. Bruce, what are you experiencing? I know this has been an emotional weekend considering what Mauricio has gone through to now have this kid deliver like this. It's, uh, it's just fantastic. We're just so thrilled that Scott's done a great job, but it's been a it's been a long weekend for us, but uh, it's a great way to come out of it. So, and Mo, we miss you and uh, thinking about you and your family. Great job, Paul. A uh, great day for the team, an incredible day for Scott Dixon. Amazing racing maturity from a 20-year-old. As Gary said, unflappable. He just goes about his job and says, that's what I'm paid to do. I'm a racing driver. He was so excited crossing the line. We've got one replay for you. And uh, hopefully we're going to get it up. Here it is. Look at this. He bumps with Wilson as he's coming to the win. So Scott Dixon, a rookie in his third start, has taken the victory. Cart now heads on to another oval. Two weeks at the Twin Ring Motegi in Japan. The Cart FedEx Championship Series. It's the Firestone Firehawk 500. And it will be right here, May 19th, on ABC. ABC Sports is online at ESPN.com. Keyword ABC Sports. I'm Paul Faith for Parker Johnstone, Jan Vegas, and Gary Gerald. This is ABC Sports, continuing the tradition of excellence.